morning, everybody. I'm Katie Schmidt, and I'm on the Z Talk team. And today we have Harriet Hodgins here. She is going to talk about grief. I hope you all got handouts. If you didn't, there are more in the back. Um, I'm going to have her introduce herself a little bit more. But she is a writer. She has been authoring books for over 38 years. So we're thankful that she's here today. Thank you. What, that, that was a nice loud clap. <laughs> well, I am a Rochester author. Uh, I've been typing in the basement, as she said, for 38 years. And if you've been doing that for 38 years, something should happen. If nothing happens, stop typing in the basement. <laughs> so uh, I thought I was the author of 37 books, but it helps to have a smart granddaughter. And she emailed the other day, me the other day and said, Grandma, I think it's 38 if you count up. And I thought, great. Now, they are not all war and peace. You know, some are long, some are short. Uh, but I work as hard on all of them, uh, whether, one, no matter what the length. Uh, one project that was near and dear to me was writing activity books for kids. Uh, for the Mayo Department of Cardiology uh, to prepare kids for heart surgery. So these were short books, but boy, I worked hard on them and they had to go through the Mayo review process. So we're here this morning to talk about creating happiness. Um, and this is something that I have been living and studying for some time. Uh, happiness is a hot topic. If you log into Amazon, you will see dozens of books about happiness. If you go into Barnes and Noble, you will see books about happiness. Uh, articles about happiness have almost become the norm in print media. And it, it's almost as if Americans are in a desperate search for happiness. But happiness isn't a chase, unfortunately. Uh, the Constitution says we have the right to be happy. But how do you exercise that right? Now, unfortunately, some of us have false ideas about happiness, and a lot of them are prevalent. One, and you know it isn't true, more money will make me happy. I'm sure all of us know someone who is well off and miserable, so that's not true. Uh, if I get promoted, I'll be happy. Maybe you want that job in the department. Only when you get the job, you find out it isn't what you thought it would be. It has more facets than you knew, and suddenly you are unhappy again. Moving to another town will make me happy. Uh, counselors call this the change of location solution. The change of location solution doesn't work because your problems move with you. So you have to solve the personal problems first. Um, I don't want to go into this one, but getting elected might make me happy. <laughs> I, am not, I am being kind to myself. I am not watching news. It's not good for my health. I'm not watching that. Um, another um, false belief, a different husband or wife will make me happy. Again, the problems that uh, infiltrated your relationship before may follow you into the next relationship. And finally, teens may tell themselves that having a baby will make them happy because babies are so cute. But they have no idea of how much work a baby is. So these statements are true for a short time, but not a long time. And the fact of the matter is, happiness is an inside job. It comes from within you. And I found this out from experience. In 2007, Helen, my older daughter, died from the injuries she received in a car crash. The crash occurred on Highway 14. I don't know what is wrong with Highway 14, but something is wrong with it because there have been too many deaths on that highway. Uh, she was picked up by Mayo 1, flown to St. Mary's, and surgeons operated on her for 20 hours in a desperate attempt to save her life. Uh, in fact, more surgeons were called in uh, finally, the lead surgeon came out and said, you know, we fix one thing and then something else fails. And he came and told us that our daughter was brain dead. 
So we made the decision that no parents want to make. We pulled life support. Uh, she had registered as an organ donor, uh, so we proceeded with that and signed documents. Uh, a woman from the uh, donation organization came in, and, and it was a very odd <laughs> glitch in the plot. She had one of the lowest cut blouses on that we've ever seen. <laughs> so every time that she leaned over to help us, we got a good view. And in the family now, we call her Mrs. Bosom. <laughs> and Mrs. Bosom was very distracting while we were signing these very serious documents. And then we got more letters, and the kids, uh, my twin grandkids, got certificates and medallions and invitations to dinners. And when they came, it was interesting, my twin grandkids just threw them in the trash because they didn't want medallions, and they didn't want certificates. They wanted their mom. But life got more complicated. Helen died on a Friday in February. On Sunday, my father-in-law succumbed to pneumonia. He was a Mayo Clinic physician, specialist in diseases of the chest. He was 98 and a half when he died. We hoped Dad would make it to 100, but he did not. He had met Will and Charlie Mayo, if you can believe that, at age 98 and a half. But I will tell you, there were, when I saw two Hodgson photos on the obit page of the Post Bulletin, I sobbed uncontrollably, because two photos were too much. Eight weeks later, my brother and only sibling died. He had been going through treatment for a rare form of cancer, uh, but he sort of survived the treatment, his heart did not. And in the fall of the same year, the twins' father died in another car crash. It was a senseless crash. It happened in Iota at an intersection. It didn't have to happen. Somebody had changed the stop signs. <clears throat> Some highway <clears throat> expert. And so cars, <clears throat> excuse me, Cars that were supposed to stop did not, and you know, and cars that used to stop were to go forward, so this car shot through a stop sign and hit the broadside, and the family dog was also fatally injured. So within six months, we lost four family members, <clears throat> and I'm going to have a drink of water. <laughs> I told my sweet husband <clears throat> that my crazy New York sense of humor would probably save me, <clears throat> and it did. And I discovered that happiness is an inside job. I started researching happiness. And I found out that humans are very special. The human mind it is able to consciously shift its thoughts. So when I had a down thought, I countered it with an up thought, a positive thought. And this takes practice, but I kept practicing and kept working on it. John and I also decided that we would cry anywhere, anytime, for as long as we could. Now, I seem to have a strange uh, sense of karma. I always wound up crying over produce. <laughs> I was like always over onions or tomatoes or whatever. I did meet a, a person at Target, someone I had worked on a committee with, and it's interesting, when, you, when I started crying at Target, people actually turned their carts around and wheeled away from me. This was the only person who wheeled toward me and gave me a hug and said she, she was so sorry. But it, it doesn't make you feel any better <laughs> when people are, you know, wheeling away from you. Um, we also decided to, to be more careful. John and I, if we had to leave the house, had a buddy system. One would be the driver, one would be the lookout, because we didn't need any more car crashes in our family. A week after Helen died, I sat down at the computer and I started just pouring my soul out into words. I had no idea 
that that was the beginning of a switch in my writing, and I think I wrote about eight grief healing books. But um, it was helpful to me to write them because as a nonfiction writer, I would learn something, but at the same time, I would be helping others. I also decided that I was worth happiness, and we, are, we all deserve happiness, and there are things that we can do uh, to achieve it, and we will talk about that, that in a moment. <clears throat> I think raising my twin grandchildren turned out to be one of the most fulfilling parts of my life. I learned more from them than I think they learned from me. Uh, the court appointed John and I as the twins' guardians. The kids were 15 when they moved in with us. It turns out our house had a perfect layout for this because we had two bedrooms upstairs, uh, we had our own master bathroom, and there was a shared bathroom uh, between their two bedrooms. They also had received good training from their mom. Helen had taught them how to do laundry, had taught them how to tidy up. Uh, young John enjoyed cooking, but didn't think anything of it, of going into the kitchen and fixing roast beef. He liked, liked being there. I did have to kind of talk with them about keep doing your laundry because that kind of uh, began to lag a bit. And finally, I printed out a giant picture of a bed bug from the internet, <laughs> and I hung it on the door, and I'll tell you, it terrified me, and it must have affected them, because the, the laundry increased. They, they started doing more. So as I was writing a, a series of books, I did write one called Happy Again, which you have some information, a, a bookmark about that, um, and it's still available. Uh, and then I, from my research, came up with this list so everybody, I hope you all have one. You, does everybody have the list? Otherwise my talk won't make sense. <laughs> so here's the list from my experience. Put quiet time on your schedule. And it's interesting to me how many people avoid quiet time. And if you think about it, in our culture, you hardly have a chance to be quiet. We have construction noise now going on in Rochester. I have a terrible urge to pick up a hammer and help, you know. All this, you can't go to an intersection without seeing construction. We have music in elevators. We have background music in stores. The Christmas carols for some stores started way too early. Um, there's loud conversation. You hear people talking on their cell phones. Uh, I was, again, at Target one time, and this woman was talking on her cell phone, and it developed into a great story, you know, and she went off the road, and I'm listening, and I'm moving a little closer, <laughs> and, you know, what, what's in, but she didn't end the plot, and so I don't know what happened to her. <clears throat> but you hear conversations probably that you should not be hearing. In truth, it's when you are quiet that you hear your thoughts and maybe thoughts from your subconscious surface. And this is the time when solutions appear. Find something to be happy about. We all have things to be happy about, and it doesn't have to be big. It can be you just had a wonderful bowl of soup, or the coffee was extra tasty in the morning. I know one thing I'm happy about is um, I, I adore kids, I, I taught for a dozen years, and I love to see and meet kids in the store, in the grocery store, in the summertime. And I'm always sad when they go back to school because then I don't see or hear them anymore. So when the kids all come back, I'm always happy, and I love to hear it. And I heard a, a mother, she had a new, almost a newborn, She's wheeling along, you know, with this little baby, and she said, oh, bread, we're going to get some bread now. And I'm thinking, whoop, they're going to get bread. You know, and she, oh, soup, we're going to get soup now. We're going to get tomato. Oh, I like tomato, you know. And so, and this is how babies learn how to talk, is that she was verbalizing all these things to her child. Give yourself permission to laugh. 
Now, after four deaths in 2007, I was not Chuckles the Clown. And finally, we decided we had to do something for ourselves. So we thought, we'll take our surviving daughter, Amy, out to dinner. And we'll meet her at the Sofitel, because she lives in the Twin Cities. We got to the Sofitel, and we were telling a story about when the whole family went to the origin of the Hodgson family, which is the Isle of Man, an island in the middle of the Irish Sea. And we combined that trip with also a trip to London. It was beastly hot in London. And when we got there, we were shown to our room. So in, Amy and I went before John could come. So we were there, the two of us. And our room was so hot, and the window only opened about five inches. So I called down to the concierge, and I said, I'm so sorry, but you know this room is not cool. Uh, the air conditioning uh, must be broken. He said, Madam, the air conditioning has not worked for 10 years. <laughs> and it says air conditioned on the outside of the hotel. We were just direct. By the time that John got there, we said, we're moving, we're moving. Hi, honey, we're moving. And we went across the street to another hotel. So we were thinking about these things at the Sofitel, telling stories. And I hadn't laughed since all the deaths. And I started to chuckle. And then we told more stories, and I started to laugh louder. And then we reminisced about the story about the air conditioning not working for 10 years. By then, we couldn't even hardly talk. And Amy said, how many years? And I went, <laughs> <laughs> And the waiter came over, and he was watching all this. Now, I admit I had a glass of wine. <laughs> and he said to me, did you want another glass of wine? I said, no, thank you. No. Uh, anyway, we laughed so hard that I thought they were going to kick us out of the soapy tub. And suddenly the, the waiter came over, now would you, would you like to order dessert? We said, well, no thank you. And he, and he walked away and a few minutes later he came back and he put some creme brulee down in front of me and he said, this is for you. And I said, what? And he said, this is for you. Now, I don't know why he gave me creme brulee. It turned into a story that was published called Belly Laughs and Creme Brulee. I think it must have been fun for him to see a family enjoy itself. Family members enjoy themselves so much. But I remember thinking, boy, this laughter feels good. And now every time I have a belly laugh, I dedicate it to Helen. Um, spend time with caring people. We all know people who are kind of downers. I know uh, one friend, every time I meet her, it's always a negative conversation. There's never anything positive. Years have passed and there's never anything positive. So I try to avoid people like this. And I hate to admit this, but after the multiple deaths, if I went to the grocery store, people felt compelled to tell me sad stories. I didn't need any more sad stories. I had my own sad stories. I didn't need any more. And so I would look at my watch and lie. And I would say, I'm so sorry, I have to leave. I have a doctor's appointment. And I would just walk away, and that got me out of the situation, and people can't get angry at you if you have a doctor's appointment, but that's the only way I could avoid the conversations. So I spend time with caring people. I avoid situations that I think will be too challenging for me. Um, and that leads into have one meaningful conversation a day. I think this is so important, and we may not realize how important. I think of the people in nursing homes who hardly get to talk to anyone, or for that matter, have no one to talk to, who don't have a meaningful conversation. And yet, one conversation can activate your mind and change your view of an entire day. 
The next one, uh, you are here for this, to care for your religious and spiritual self. I try to do that. Uh, how you uh, enact your beliefs is your decision. For me, I do a lot of free writing. Uh, people often ask me to write. Uh, I do a lot of free speaking. Um, I don't charge. My goal is to just leave something good behind. Um, the only reason I would charge anybody is if I had to travel. Uh, last year in the fall, I spoke at AARP uh, Minnesota, and they did pay for a caregiver to come in and care for my disabled husband and paid my transportation. Um, know what is important and what isn't. I think that every so often we need to give ourselves a reality check. And the reality is, if I do not see and listen to every newscast, the world will not fall apart. So I am backing away from newscasts. I'm tired of the arguments. I'm tired of the lack of civility. I'm tired of the childish behavior. And so uh, I'm, I've crossed that off the list. And I. And I, I hate to admit this, but I have become addicted to the Hallmark Channel. <laughs> and the thing is, after you've watched quite a few movies, you know exactly, it, you know what's going to come, right? You're going to have the conflict at the end, the misunderstanding. It's going to end with a kiss. And then I'm beginning to recognize the set. Oh, there's the barn. <laughs> and, but they paid for the, the sleigh. <laughs> So they have to use the sleigh, and if you look carefully, the sleigh has wheels. <laughs> and it, it is, of course, fake snow. Yeah. So um, I do know what is important and what isn't. The next point is share with others, even if you have little to give. My daughter, Helen, uh, was often uh, pretty strapped for cash. She was an adult. Uh, we let her make her own way. We had given her a good education. She went and finally earned a, a master's degree in uh, engineering. Uh, she was a composite engineer, and that's plastics and, and other materials. Um, Helen couldn't get a job locally, and she got a job in Fridley, Minnesota. So every day she got up at 4 in the morning and drove to Fridley, and if I was going to the Twin Cities, she'd call me and say, Mom, uh, I'm going past the refinery. These are the driving conditions. Um, so, and she was assured of advancement in the company. She was in charge of three production lines. Um, at her memorial service uh, at Autumn Ridge Church, uh, one of the workers came up to me and said, your daughter was so funny. And he said, the day he laughed really hard is um, they, they were making, um, um, what's the word, of transformers or some mechanical part for Kuwait. And uh, so she was trying to get the production line moving and she told everybody, hey, we're not making toasters here. And he said it gave him a good laugh, but it kept them uh, on target. So. Um, Helen, when she was strapped, never forgot, though, to give to others. And a friend of hers, probably her best friend, said that Helen came to her door one day with the cutting of a berry bush. I think it was raspberries. And together, they planted it in the backyard. And that bush grew and flourished and had berries long after Helen had died. And so that was her gift to her friend. She might bake pies and take one to a person or bake cookies, and she adored Christmas. Set a goal and pursue it energetically. In 2007, after four family members died, my goal was to make it to the next minute, and then maybe the next five minutes, and then finally the next hour. And uh, it was tough going, uh, but writing, uh, to help others helped me. Um, I have been reminded of this point recently because John and I just moved to Charter House. And it's been a bigger adjustment than I thought. You know, we were in the Air Force for many years. My husband is a specialist in aviation medicine, aerospace medicine, and internal medicine. 
and I'm a specialist in being his wife. And so we knew how to move, but um, in 2013, uh, he was in terrible pain, and it turns out that uh, he had a, a Dacron descending aorta, and the connection between the Dacron and the real aorta failed, and he was bleeding to death. And I got him to St. Mary's just in time. Uh, they were pumping blood into him as fast as they could, not keeping up with the blood loss. He had three emergency operations, and during the third one, uh, suffered a spinal cord injury and that made him paraplegic. I became his caregiver the night I drove him to St. Mary's. But there's a miracle attached to that, because you don't recover, usually, from spinal cord injury. But after a year, he received a notice from Mayo saying that he had an appointment at rehab at St. Mary's. And I thought, he's been in bed a year. What are they going to do? We went to the appointment, we got there, they started working with him. Things progressed very quickly. And they would do exercises, strengthening. Finally, one day they put him on the zero gravity machine, which is a harness on a track. And they said, well, now today you're going to walk, John. And he did take some steps with the help. He got better and better, transferred then to taking steps with a walker. And then finally the day came, they said, and now, John, you're going to walk down the hall. And I thought, are they crazy? Well, it was Christmas time. He started walking. He went 82 steps. The therapist was almost in tears and then said, Merry Christmas. And it was. And he has had some setbacks. He's back in some intense therapy now. And that's another story. Uh, maybe another book. <laughs> but we have had some miracles, and we are together, but we are together at Charterhouse. It's a much smaller space. It's just over a 1,000 square feet. Uh, our town home was 1,850, so I miss those few extra square feet. John misses them, and he keeps backing into door jams, or, or doors, or corners. Uh, we haven't been there, you know, like just over two months. I've already had touch-up painting done. I'm not used to being with crowds of people, so many people. I think there are 300 residents. And we got there and someone went, Harriet, Harriet, you can be on the activities committee. <laughs> and I, I have committed up to my beady little eyeballs, and I don't want to be on the activities committee. Thank you very much. And the other thing is, a lot of times I'm writing in my head, and I don't want to stop and have a conversation. I'm working on that last phrase. And so that's been hard for me. And um, it's living with a, a group of people is just different than independent living. I, I think we are still working on the next point of creating new memories to treasure. My grandkids, turned out wonderfully. And I will say that there are stories of people who have gotten guardianship, raised their kids, and have horrible endings. Our grandson is in his last year at the Mayo Clinic School of Medicine. He, in Mar uh, let's see, May, in May he will receive his diploma. And his last name is Welby. He will be Dr. Welby. <laughs> which he is kidded about mercilessly. <laughs> My granddaughter married a minister who is very tall. She is very short, not even five feet. She keeps saying maybe she could become, you know, grow to five feet. It's never going to happen. <laughs> um, they are foster parents. They have fostered several children, uh, four. Uh, they kept hoping that they would be able to adopt some uh, during in the foster system. This didn't work out. One we were sure was going to be part of our family, and then a distant uncle uh, claimed the child. And so they were, they grieved. They, they were very upset. But now Haley and her tall husband, James, have just adopted a baby in Florida, and the adoption was finalized on Friday. 
and Haley is expecting a biological child in May. Oh, are they going to be busy? They are going to be busy. So we have a good ending to our story, but it's due to the kids' determination. They were determined that they were going to study hard in school and do a good job. And my grandson has chosen interventional radiology as his specialty. I wish I could define that. No. I know. It sounds complicated. Yeah. So that's, I don't know how many more hours of, or years of school. A lot. A lot. So we are creating new memories, and we are going to have Christmas Eve dinner in our tiny apartment. I figure if you get a seat, hold on to it. <laughs> like this. Um, it's going to be wonderful to see the new little baby who is a chunk. He's really growing quickly. And these are new memories to treasure. And because John was determined to make the most of his life, whatever it may be, when Haley and James were married, he escorted her down the aisle in his wheelchair. And before the service, they were showing pictures of Helen as a baby and Helen growing. Uh, my surviving daughter, Amy, who is a therapist, came over and handed me a whole bunch of tissues and said, prepare yourself, Mom. It's going to be tough. I look around. John had been waiting out in the hall, and the music started, and he started rolling uh, down the aisle. Uh, Haley held on to his arm as if he were walking. People were crying. <laughs> Anybody who knew our story was crying. So I'm thinking, I, I hope I get through this because it was a beautiful ceremony, but it was also tough. Uh, but we have created new memories as a family together. Let nature fill your soul. I have um, just begun to realize how important that is to me. One of the hardest things about living in a group home, uh, see, there's a, there's a slip, group home. <laughs> group facility. <laughs> is that when I open the door, I'm not going outside. I'm going down, excuse me, a dreary hall. I want to put up a sign, it needs a paint job, you know. It's a dreary hall. So, in, at our town home, we had birds in the back. We had several bird feeders that a great variety came. One day I was doing dishes and a huge deer walked by with a big rack, you know, and he seemed to know the neighborhood, you know. <laughs> and, How are you, you know? So I miss all of that and I miss the flowers in the front garden. But I realize now that nature is more important to me and does fill my soul. And finally, share your happiness with others. You know, people can tell if you are genuine. They can tell if you are really happy or not. So after I moved into Charter House and I was feeling down, and John, you know, always says, oh, you know, hi, honey, you know, did you sleep well? You know, that's a whole discussion. And uh, how are you today? And finally, I said, you know, I'm down. I said, this, this is too small. And, we spent so much money renovating because, unfortunately, I have a master's degree in art and uh, I knew in my mind what I wanted our apartment to look like. And I thought, if I don't make it that, I'm going to be miserable if I don't make it a beautiful place to be. So I was feeling down and, uh, and he said, you know, that he was so grateful to be with me and to be alive. So we have been married 62 years, uh, so we think it will last <laughs> and look forward to the next few years. And we take care of each other. As my daughter Amy said, Mom, I love to see your relationship. When you aren't feeling you know, so, so good, Dad comes and rescues you, and the same is true of him when we each interact with the other. Um, we hope to be able to help others as best we can. Um, some days are a challenge for John, some days are a challenge for me, and I will tell you honestly, at the end of the day, after I have taken care of him and done all the things that I need to do, like make medical appointments, pick up prescriptions, and so forth, I am a tired person. Several people have said to me that you will have to give up your writing career in order to be a caregiver. 
And I thanked them and I thought, boy, that is terrible advice. Because if I did that, I would be giving up on myself. And I refused to do that. So I think, uh, just as I was getting ready to move from the town home, when I should have been packing boxes, when I should have been sorting things for the Goodwill, I had a book idea. So I sat down and started writing, and I wrote a children's activity book for kids who are grieving. Now I do have a Bachelor of Science degree in early child education, and I have the art degree to think of activities for the book. And I was so excited about it, I sent it right to a publisher. I didn't write a book proposal, I didn't write a cover letter, off it went. And she got back to me quickly and said, Harriet, I think this is two books, not one. I want you to divide it, one for the younger kids, like four to eight, one for kids nine to 12. So that meant I stopped moving, sat down at the computer and did that. Uh, she has given me a verbal acceptance of the two books. So I, I may hit 40, <laughs> may hit 40. Uh, I'm waiting for the contracts. Uh, and then uh, I just met a person I had never met. Uh, I don't know why our paths didn't cross. And we are collaborating on a book together. So I am making the most of each day. And each day I think of my mother who used to say to me, the good fairy isn't coming. Now mom did not say that to quell my belief in good fairies. She said that to tell me that I was my own good fairy, and you are your own good fairy, and you are in charge of your own happiness. And I just followed all those steps again after going to Charter House, and I can tell you they work. We don't have much time. Yes. What value do you see? Uh, what value do you see in the suffering that you've been through? Um, we all want to practice happiness, um, but do we need to practice grieving too, and and learning from that? I think you need to uh, ac accept grief, um, respond to it as best you can, uh, I, and you have to work that out for yourself. Uh, for me, it was uh, writing grief healing books for other people. Uh, I do did speak at grief conferences. I'm a member of the Compassionate Friends, which is an international organization for people who have suffered the loss of a child. So you can also um, connect with other people. Uh, because of the multiple deaths in our family, I have met people that I never thought I would meet. I have benefited from them. I have written books that I never thought I would write. Uh, I have said things I never thought I would say. <laughs> yes, and, and it, you can accept that. You can, you can go with that and make the most of it. Any other comments or questions? No, there's not a groundswell here. <laughs> well, thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. <laughs>